Hello, welcome. Um, so before we start, um, I want to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which this event is taking place, the land of the Wandry, and pay respect to their elders and families. So tonight, as you know, we have Professor Garneau who is speaking. Um, he is a professorial research fellow in economics at the University of Melbourne. Tonight, he's going to be talking about decarbonizing transport and industry. This is a topic that is dear to my heart. Um, I've recently been working on research in both of these sectors. So in transportation, I've been primarily working on traffic congestion, specifically in how changing the way that we pay for roads can lead to reductions in congestion and getting a better measure of who the potential winners and losers would be of this, these types of changes. Now, carbon emissions are just one of the externalities caused by our demand for transportation services. Some of the policies that we think about to reduce emissions in transport like better transit, thoughtful city planning, or even just policies that allow people to sometimes work from home can also have large positive benefits in reducing congestion and, road and traffic accidents. But other policies like electric vehicles, although they're important, they only address one problem, which is the fuel emissions, the carbon emissions themselves. They will not on their own solve the rest. I've also been working on industrial emissions, the second part of, the, of this talk today, specifically industrial emissions from manufacturing firms in India and in China. I've been looking at how different industrial policies, whether they be trade policies, infant industry promotion policies, have led to environmental costs and benefits. China has made important progress in reducing the emissions intensity of manufacturing, but has also experienced a lot of output growth, in part in order to manufacture the consumer goods that we produce. So with this background, I look very keenly forward to hearing Ross's thoughts tonight, decarbonizing transport and industry. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Leslie, and uh, thanks for uh, so many of you coming along again uh, uh, beyond the call of duties, uh, lecture four, but uh, thank you. Uh, uh, industry and transport emissions have grown rapidly over the past decade, and I'll put some numbers up in a moment, uh, and I'm going to say something this evening about fugitive emissions as well. Um, trend, these three sets of emissions, industry, transport and fugitive, have increased their share of total Australian emissions from about a third of the total to about half in the past 20 years, and they've grown rapidly since my reviews. First sight, these sectors are comprehensive failures of Australian emissions policy. Uh, the early reversal of well-established trends is a necessary condition for Australia contributing its fair share to achieving the Paris goals. Uh, in this lecture, uh, I hope to explain that the right kind of early reversal of the trends in industry would open up a new era of ex expansion of industrial investment and production. And early reversal of the trend in transport would make a positive contribution to rising living standards. Well, first, uh, uh, where, where these sectors sit, uh, transport, 1990, this is absolute levels of emissions, 2000, 2010, industrial processes uh, growing steadily and fugitive emissions growing from a relatively small set to something quite large in the scheme of things. Last week we talked about electricity, which is a, a very different story of emissions growth. Just looking at these separately, the last 20 years, uh, this is uh, industrial emissions, uh, as with, uh, although not so pronounced as uh, with uh, electricity, there, well, in the period where there was confident expectation of carbon pricing these years, uh, there was something of a fall which continued in the carbon pricing period and it's been an increase in emissions since then. Uh, transport sector emissions, just steady, steady growth. Now, transport was not covered by carbon pricing, so you wouldn't expect uh, an effect uh, on uh, transport emissions. And then uh, fugitive emissions, again, uh, a bit of a dip uh, in the period of expectation of carbon pricing, although uh, coal exports were growing quite strongly through that period, uh, uh, there was an awareness that you had to do something uh, to control emissions, but uh, 
uh, and that continued through the carbon pricing period, but very rapid growth in emissions since then. Uh, in talking about the industry transformation, uh, we, we, we'll see that it has uh, four main elements. Um, electrification and decarbonization of, el of electricity, electrification of industry and decarbonization of electricity. Development of hydrogen-based processes built on renewable electricity. Substitution of biomass for fossil hydrocarbons as industrial feedstocks stocks and carbon capture, utilization and storage. And everything comes back to these four stories, which are really three because hydrogen or renewable hydrogen, zero emissions hydrogen is based on electricity decarbonization. Uh, the transport transformation is built on electrification of vehicles and decarbonization of electricity, on hydrogen based processes built on renewable electricity, on substitution of biofuels for fossil energy, um, uh, expanding hydrogen use in transport and industry is mutually supportive as it helps to provide the scale that brings costs down for both. Uh, if achieved within the right policy framework, the interaction of electrification in the industry and transport transformations can reduce costs of both through more uh, balanced and more complete utilization of grid capacity. Um, I discussed the industry and transport transformations in detail in the 2008 review and briefly uh, updated that in 2011. Reading those books now, what stands out is uh, my comprehensive underestimation of the rate of reduction of costs of low and zero emissions relative to established technologies. Uh, so, my detailed modeling in 2008 therefore underestimated the pace and overestimated the cost of the Australian transition. The 2008 review expressed high confidence that a combination of battery and hydrogen electric, electric vehicles will be highly competitive eventually with internal combustion engines, but they, would not, but they would not come to dominate the cars on Australian roads until well into the second half of the century. Australia would become an, again an attractive location for energy intensive manufacturing in a low carbon world which it was ceasing to be in the high carbon world with aluminium as an exemplar but not until the 2030s long time frames for emergence of near zero zero emissions technologies made the mix of established technologies important to the rate of emissions reduction in the first half of the 21st century Expansion of rail and the development of more compact cities with greater opportunities for public and active transport, active transport, walking and cycling were valuable in themselves, but also important to emission levels for a long period. Today, there's still a strong case for expanding use of public and active transport, but it is not a compelling climate change mitigation case any longer. For industry, the reduction in costs of renewable electricity and in zero emissions industrial processes more generally and improved knowledge of the opportunities is brought forward by a couple of decades at a time when Australia's rich renewable energy resources provide <laughs> this country with decisive competitive advantages in major industrial activities. There's been major progress over recent years in Australia and globally in thinking about how we can decarbonize industry and transport at low cost. It's also been great progress in research, development and commercialization of low carbon technologies. Uh, a lot of this has been done in Australia and uh, our contributions to the uh, frontier research have been particularly large, including the CSIRO, uh, our, our best universities. Uh, and uh, uh, since 2011, a very important development has been the, the emergence of a, a couple of network institutions that have played a big role in plugging us into developments in these fields in the rest of the world. Uh, Climate Works Australia, uh, supported by the Maya Foundation, based at Monash University, and Beyond Zero Emissions. And more recently, uh, uh, our host this evening, uh, Australian German College and the Climate and Energy Transition Hub have uh, helped to play this role. Uh, so uh, being plugged in means that uh, even when uh, things have not been going very well in Australian discussion of, of the transition, 
uh, we're, we're in, aware of, many Australians are aware of how much is going on in the rest of the world. And in that context, I found the work of the Energy Transitions Commission in Europe particularly helpful in the areas covered by this evening's lecture. Uh, Australian manufacturing enjoyed a period of extraordinary dynamism in the two decades that I call the reform era from 1983. It ended at the beginning of this century. Uh, for a couple of decades, manufactured uh, value added uh, in real terms grew by double digits steadily for a long period. Uh, that ended and we entered what in the book Dog Days I call the great Australian complacency of the early 21st century uh, with a backdrop first of the China resources boom and then of a comprehensive <coughs> corruption of our political culture. Uh, and uh, uh, that, that era of dynamism uh, in the Australian economy uh, ended. Uh, we won't uh, get back to strong performance in, in uh, any area of manufacturing, including in areas uh, that uh, are opening up as a result of the carbon transition, uh, uh, unless we get our political culture working better more generally. Uh, so I'm not going to talk much about the wider political and, uh, uh, um, and policy context, but uh, I, I don't want anyone to think that it won't affect performance. Uh, Decarbonisation of global manufacturing will be built, built on energy and materials efficiency, recycling, and then the four elements that I mentioned earlier. Uh, we've been mostly weak with energy efficiency and need to catch up with other developed countries and China. I remember not many years ago taking a group of Chinese engineers to Australia's biggest steelworks and they were very excited and asked if they could bring uh, young engineers from China uh, out to have a look. And I asked the manager and uh, my visitors said, yes, we want to show the young people what it was like in the olden days. Uh, <laughs> with, 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 with waste heat from the blast furnace just going up into the atmosphere. Um, uh, electrification, replacement of fossil hydrocarbon feedstocks by biomass and uh, carbon capture. Uh, utilization and storage provide the foundations for our low carbon opportunity. In the last lecture, I showed that Australia could be globally competitive in the zero carbon world economy in electricity supply. Uh, and that this would make us uh, uh, globally competitive in uh, hydrogen brake based processes. Um, in addition, we've got much more than our per capita share of potential for industrial use of low cost biomass. Uh, and uh, uh, we have much more than our share of low cost carbon capture and storage opportunities. A lot of the fundamental work on which has been done uh, by the uh, carbon capture and storage uh, uh, center at this university. Uh, you know, I, I've spent a fair bit of time in recent years talking to global metals and materials processes uh, about determinants of electricity costs in different places and uh, uh, the, the lowest cost lo uh, locations for large scale electricity intensive uh, plants in the developed world are now in Canada and Iceland uh, uh, where uh, an industrial operation can get access to firm power at around 50 Australian dollars in 2019 prices. Um, the, uh, the, this uh, view of, uh, of, of competitive pricing is supported by the Energy Transition Commission's uh, report on hard to abate sectors in 2019, in 2019, which came up with basically that same number. And as I said last week, uh, uh, Australian renewables based generation from good resources could be firmed and delivered to favorably located industrial centers at these costs um, within the policy frameworks that I suggested in last week's lecture. Where electricity is available at globally competitive prices, there are economic advantages in processing Australian mineral resources at home. Uh, these advantages are much greater in the zero emissions world economy, where energy resources are not so easily tradable across long ocean distances and international transport costs higher for raw materials of other kinds. 
you can transport coal from Australian to Northeast Asian ports for around 10% of its value. Natural gas absorbs 10% of the gas's calorific value just in the liquefaction process. And then you've got all the great costs of those uh, uh, huge refrigerators that carry uh, the, the gas to uh, Japan or China or Korea, and then the additional costs of de degasification uh, or regasification. And then uh, more expensive again is international transport of hydrogen. Hydrogen liquefies at a temperature close to absolute zero and absorbs about 30% of its calorific value just in that process. And hydrogen shipping is substantially more elaborate and expensive than for natural gas. So the costs of hydrogen at ports of destination are likely to be more than twice as high uh, as uh, at points of production through electrolysis at home. Uh, so uh, uh, it doesn't make much economic sense to shift uh, hydrogen from Australia and use it as an industrial processing base in Northeast Asia. And uh, the other means of international transport of uh, energy is uh, long distance high voltage uh, direct, current, direct current submarine transmission and that would add to electricity prices a, a not dissimilar proportion to uh, what uh, hydrogen international transport adds to hydrogen cost. Doesn't mean to say there's not a place for it, there will be a place for it, but the place is not uh, providing energy for processing Australian raw materials. Uh, it follows that uh, the economics strongly favour use of Australian electricity and hydrogen to process Australian minerals at home rather than sending them uh, to Asian destinations. Uh, the costs of energy transport provide natural protection for value added through use of low cost energy at home with additional natural protection provided by the costs of international shipping of Australian raw materials effective rates of natural protection for Australian value added for processed metals and other minerals range up to hundreds of percent. Here I'm using the concept of effective protection that Max Corden uh, introduced 60 or 70 years ago. Uh, separately from the natural protection, Australia has comparative advantage in processing many minerals. Uh, these processes are capital intensive and outside the many industries in which monopoly artificially elevates costs, Australia has access to capital at globally competitive prices. Australia also has rich resources of human capital across the range of expertise required for globally competitive large-scale processing of resources, engineering, financial, geological, metallurgical, and project management. The low-hanging fruit will be processing of Australian materials that use intensively electricity, directly or as hydrogen, or carbon from biomass, or require capture of carbon emissions. The advantages are magnified when more than one of these advantages are relevant. There are many large industries in which the price of electricity is or could be a major factor in global competitiveness. Aluminium is currently the most electricity intensive product entering world trade in large volumes. At market prices for aluminium metal and $50 per megawatt hour of electricity, electricity accounts for about one fifth of the cost of the product. China produces more than half of the 60 million tons of global production, and nearly all for its own use. China's production grew rapidly through the first 12 years of the 21st century, putting downward pressure on global prices. In recent years, within the new model of Chinese economic growth, China has downgraded the priority of investment in new aluminium capacity as its energy intensity and environmental impact do not fit the post-2012 model of economic growth. As the growth in world demand requires new capacity somewhere in the world, it is likely to be placed in the most competitive locations outside China. Australia is a, now a modest global producer of aluminium, about 2.5% of the total, and a substantial exporter, nearly 10%. Australian production grew on low cost hydroelectric power in Tasmania, that was the beginning, and later in much larger low cost coal in Queensland, New South Wales and Victoria. As world energy costs increased and environmental amenity rose in Japanese priorities in the late 1970s and 1980s.
Australian competitiveness in aluminium production has been challenged by rising electricity costs in the early 21st century, and no Australian smelter is at present certain of long-term survival in the absence of fundamental changes in electricity supply. Alongside electricity, alum alumina, refined aluminium oxide, is the largest cost in production of aluminium. Australia is the world's largest producer of alumina, about a quarter of the world total. Most of it exported to smelters all over the world. Australian production is two locations, uh, near, near Collie, south of Perth, and on the Gulf of Carpentaria. Uh, while the main sources of emissions in Australian aluminium smelting is the production of electricity from coal, there are also large emissions from within the process itself. The two global aluminium companies smelting metal in Australia, Alcoa and Rio Tinto, have committed to producing the metal globally with zero emissions. This could involve provision of carbon sourced from biomass for electrolysis. Australia is the natural location for the growth of world aluminium smelting capacity, utilising its own alumina, if it is able to offer globally competitive prices for zero emissions electricity. The largest opportunity in quantum numbers of dollars, numbers of jobs, is in production of iron metal or steel from iron oxide ores. Australia is by far the world's largest producer, nearly two-fifths of the world total, and exporter, nearly three-fifths of iron oxide. China takes about 70% of Australian exports. China has supplied most of the increase in global steel production so far this century, and now accounts for over half the global total output of about 1.8 billion tonnes. Most of the steel produced in the old developed countries in North America and Western Europe is now from recycled scrap through the electricity intensive electric arc process. This can be zero emission steel if, if supplied by renewable electricity. China and other developing countries do not yet have the steel consumption legacy that produces large amounts of scrap and most of their output is from highly emissions intensive production of iron oxide using coke. Production of steel is the world's largest industrial source of carbon emissions, about 6% of total emissions, very big. The lowest cost zero carbon route currently available for converting iron ore into iron and steel begins with direct reduction of iron oxide using hydrogen. The direct reduction process is now well established using natural gas um, through a, a process owned jointly by uh, the Japanese company Mitsubishi and the German company Siemens, the Midrex process. About 75 million tonnes of iron metal is now produced globally through direct reduction. Uh, increasing proportions of hydrogen are being introduced with natural gas in some Midrex plants. Up to 70% hydrogen has been substituted for natural gas without changes in the plant. This reduced emissions to 15% of blast furnace production. Pilot plants have operated with 100% uh, hydrogen and zero emissions. The iron metal is converted into steel in an electric arc furnace. Renewable hydrogen is used to reduce iron oxide. The electric arc operated with renewable energy and the relatively small carbon inputs necessary for the process are drawn from biomass. Primary steel is produced with zero emissions. This looks now to be the likely route to removing emissions from steel making. The hydrogen electric arc route to steel is one of the most electricity intensive major industrial processes of about five megawatt hours of electricity for each tonne of steel. And, uh, at, at uh, recent steel prices uh, and $50 uh, <coughs> per megawatt uh, power, about 25% of the value of hot rolled coil produced through a zero emissions process will be the cost of the electricity. Uh, right now, direct reduction with natural gas at WA domestic prices and power available for the electric arc at $50 per megawatt hour is highly competitive with blast furnace production, uh, reduction using coke. The cost of electrolysis plant for hydrogen production would need to fall by over half and electricity be available at that price for hydrogen to be competitive with WA domestic natural gas, which of course is cheaper than the rest of the world because of domestic uh, reservation policies. Meanwhile, increasing carbon constraints will raise the cost of the blast furnace route, including through carbon pricing, already very influential in Europe, and the mandating of carbon capture uh, utilization and uh, storage. 
starting now with mainly natural gas and increasing the renewable hydrogen proportion over time would seem to be a realistic approach to entry into the market for low carbon steel preparatory to movement to zero emissions. As the world moves closer to requiring, requiring zero emission steel, and we're not going to get uh, the Paris goals without zero emission steel, there is scope for iron, metal and steel production at an immense scale near Australian magnetite resources in the Pilbara, the Midwest and the Southwest of WA, and the Upper Spencer Gulf and adjacent parts of South Australia. At least it can be expected that in a zero emissions world, iron production would migrate to Australia from those parts of industrial Asia with the weakest endowment of renewable energy resources. Japan and Korea would be the start, and with weaker imperatives because of better domestic renewable energy resources, a proportion of, Japan, of Chinese capacity would follow. All of these countries are at or past peak steel consumption and production, and the proportion of domestic requirements recycling from uh, scrap is, is high uh, in Korea and Japan or will grow rapidly in China. Uh, so the, the main growth story for steel is the rest of the developing world, uh, where, uh, which, where countries are still experiencing rapid growth in primary steel demand, most importantly in Southeast and South Asia. Uh, the low cost route to zero emission supply of steel in these countries would build on high proportions of metal imported from Australia. Um, a third uh, major industry in, in this new world is production of pure silicon from sand or quartz uh, and its incorporation into other valuable compounds. Uh, this is also one of the most um, energy intensive industrial processes. In the one Australian plant uh, making pure silicon, um, owned and operated by Simcoa at Kemerton near Collie in, in WA, about one third of costs are energy and 30% carbon. Carbon is drawn in the ratio of 2.2 to 1 from biomass and fossil sources. Demand for high grade silicon has increased rapidly with the growth of computers and PV panels, two of the great growth industries of the world, and the essential ingredient in both is pure silicon. Uh, use of output from particular plants uh, is constrained by purity uh, with high grade product depending on the quality of the sand or quartz and of the carbon uh, used in the process and you can get very pure carbon from uh, uh, effective processing of uh, Australian eucalypts. Australia is a small producer of, of silicon in a global context but commands interest in high prices for its exceptional quality. China produces about two-thirds of global silicon Chinese production is challenged by high costs of electricity, much higher than globally competitive prices potentially available in Australia, and by local environmental constraints. Chinese production has not increased for several years and its large export volumes have been absorbed in increasing proportions by growing domestic demand. The economically natural development of the global market would see expansion of production located in places with access to globally competitive power and adjacent to supplies of high quality quartz and sand. Several Australian locations qualify. And the fourth of these energy intensive uh, industries that could have a big part in uh, a zero carbon Australian economy. Ammonia plays a large part in global production of nitrogenous fertilizers and other chemical products. A global production of around 150 million tonnes per annum is overwhelmingly from fossil fuels. Hydrogen is extracted from gas or coal and combined with atmospheric nitrogen under great pressure and heat through the Haber-Bosch process. Production of hydrogen is highly emissions intensive and Haber-Bosch is highly energy intensive. The latter can be rendered zero emissions through use of renewable electricity as the energy source. The production of hydrogen could be with zero emissions if hydrogen were produced through electrolysis using renewable electricity. Ammonium production typically requires about 10 megawatt hours per tonne of electricity and 10 megawatt hours per tonne of heat energy through conventional processes, which could all be converted uh, with full electrification uh, through a hydrogen route. There is a strong demand for renewable ammonia in Europe in particular, and increasingly Japan and Korea. Uh, beyond its current uses, it is potentially a carrier for hydrogen that can be shipped at lower cost than hydrogen in liquid form. <clears throat> 
can be used to fuel thermal power plants and internal combustion engines. A premium can now be earned for green ammonia in Europe and Japan, and that's helpful for launching hydrogen-based projects. Australia currently contributes only about 1% to global ammonia output, mostly for domestic fertilizer and explosives, but with exports from the Yarra plant in the Pilbara. That's an interesting case. It's based on natural gas, currently hugely emissions intensive. It's owned by the Nor Norwegian Sovereign Wealth Fund, uh, which a year or two ago took a decision to get out of all, uh, all high emissions activities. And, and the word has come down to the Australian subsidiary that uh, they, they have to find a zero emissions uh, transition. Um, and uh, they've got a pilot plant of uh, solar-based uh, hydrogen production to start that process. Uh, we've also recently uh, had the announcement of a, uh, of a solar-based hydrogen, uh, uh, zero emission hydrogen plant in Port Lincoln, funded by, partly by ARENA. Uh, so we're at the forefront of, uh, 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 of, of working practically on uh, zero emissions ammonia. The conversion of renewable hydrogen into ammonia is through a standard process. So the, uh, Bosch has been around for a hundred years. That's not going to get cheaper. Uh, but uh, what's required to launch renewable ammonia on a large scale is reduction in the cost of electrolysis plant, and therefore the cost of hydrogen for the Haber Bosch process. This will be driven by rapid expansion of global hydrogen demand for transport, steel making and other industrial uses, as well as ammonia. Uh, the, uh, the report of uh, uh, the, the international group to which I've already referred uh, uh, says that uh, getting rid of emissions in the hard to abate sector is going to require a 100 fold increase in global hydrogen production. And uh, uh, as we saw last week in talking about the relationship between scale of output and costs of of uh, other commodities that have recently seen huge growth in demand like photovoltaic and battery and, uh, and wind turbines. Uh, there's a lot of scope with a 100 fold increase in global production for very large reductions in electrolysis plant costs. So I think there are good prospects for the halving of electrolysis costs that are necessary for renewable hydrogen to be competitive with natural gas without uh, as a support from uh, uh, carbon pricing or other incentives. Um, scale in Australian production, uh, as, as domestic production as well as global <coughs> demand matters uh, because some of the elements of costs are domestic and they have to be driven down as well. Um, biomass will emerge as a scarce and valuable base for the chemicals industry in the zero emissions global economy. And uh, Scarce and expensive, it will be driven to its most valuable uses by high prices. For some time, biomass will be required for fuels for long distance civil aviation. Most other transport can probably get on without it, but we don't yet have a solution for very long distance civil aviation that doesn't involve the concentrated energy of liquid hydrocarbons. So there'll be some bioenergy required for that purpose. Some of the high value uses will be as inputs into energy intensive chemical processes. Carbon fiber is one of these. There are many others. These will be special opportunities in established Australian regions which have access to low cost renewable electricity and biomass. Where these are adjacent to high quality geosequestration sites, capture and storage of emissions will lead to the holy grail of climate change mitigation, negative emissions through bioenergy, carbon capture and storage, BECs. The Australian advantage in processing materials will be strongly focused initially on a few regions. The processing of minerals and metals, it will be an advantage to be located close to mining of the raw material. For iron, it will be WA. Later, when the world has moved to zero emissions, it will be South Australia as well. For aluminium, it will be especially WA and Queensland. For both iron and aluminium, there will be opportunities for transporting oxide ores to particularly favorable processing locations. So all the action in processing the minerals won't be on top of the mines themselves. Uh, silicon opportunities will be more widely spread. 
through the many locations with high quality quartz or sand. The smelting and refining of other metals, including copper, nickel, titanium, cobalt, vanadium, and lithium, amongst elements that will, that will be boosted exceptionally by the zero emissions transition, uh, will be undertaken at strong industrial locations at reasonable distance from the mines. Carbon fiber and other energy intensive chemical processes will have special advantages close to sources of biomass. Some products have only electricity as a major material input and can be located wherever electricity costs are low and industrial facilities of high quality. Ammonia and nitrogenous fertilizers and explosives made from it provide the most important example. New industrial strengths will be built more easily in provincial cities with strong industrial traditions, with established energy, port, other transport and training infrastructure. This points to the Collie region in WA, the mining ports of the Pilbara, the upper Spencer Gulf in South Australia, Portland and the Latrobe Valley in Victoria, Port Kembla and Newcastle in New South Wales, Gladstone and perhaps Townsville and Mackay in Queensland, and the established materials processing regions of Tasmania. There will be opportunities in some of these locations to break free from the Australian historical legacy of high electricity costs through provision of mainly unregulated electricity supply systems. There are advantages in location at the transmission nodes built around the declining fossil power generation. Collie, WA, the Upper Spencer Gulf, Port Augusta, the Latrobe Valley, Newcastle, Gladstone, and Northern Tasmania has a similar advantage from the hydroelectric legacy. In these places, the established electricity network set up to take coal-based power all over a state uh, can bring back renewable energy to uh, um, processing facilities at the node. You won't have to rebuild the transmission infrastructure. You might have to regulate its price in a different way. Uh, the advantages are greater if there are low-cost hydro or pumped hydro storage sites nearby. And uh, here there are big advantages to be close to the Great Divide uh, because all the way from the Latrobe Valley uh, up to uh, Townsville. Uh, that's where Australia's exceptional pumped hydro sites are apart from Tasmania. Uh, but uh, there are some opportunities in deep depleted mines uh, elsewhere in the country. The biomass strengths are first of all in the established pulp and paper wood chip export centres. Some of these are near established transmission nodes and industrial cities, Northern Tasmania, the Latrobe Valley, Portland, Collie. The biggest challenge in industrial use of biomass is usually the collection of dispersed material. The problem has been solved, although not always at low cost for the paper mills and wood chip export facilities. Large amounts of biomass are available as per gas from sugar processing along the coast of central and north Queensland. Research, development and commercialization of biomass concentration technologies, for example, by Renergy at Curtin University, hold out prospects for low cost transportation of concentrated carbon and hydrocarbons <coughs> to major industrial plants. Australia, more than any other country, has prospects for low cost production and harvesting of biomass from land that is not suitable for food production. For example, from the Mallee across the drier parts of the WA, South Australian and Northwest Victorian wheat belts. Uh, the use of the Mallee has additional advantages of subterranean <coughs> biological sequestration of carbon. Algae is potentially important biomass feedstock to industry in many coastal locations. In my 2008 work, I highlighted the opportunity of the Australian Mallee and I'm very pleased that uh, work has continued on that, especially in Western Australia. The, the Mallee is rather an exceptional Australian um, part of life. Uh, it's adapted to the fire prone Australian environment by having its trunk under the ground. So fire can come past, it loses everything above the ground and just grows again from the trunk, which means you can harvest it. Um, 30 tonnes uh, per annum in a, uh, uh, an arid location uh, and uh, uh, and the, the trunk keeps growing and sequestering more and more carbon under the ground. And uh, that group at Curtin University has been working on the technologies to efficiently process that and handle the, the big problem of biomass of, uh, uh, of collecting it uh, efficiently. And then uh, 
On the other advantage that's going to be important in the low carbon industrial world, uh, the global mapping identifies Australia as a region of exceptional opportunity for low cost geological sequestration. Uh, the best sites have geological structures that are favorable for permanent storage that are well known from oil and gas production and close to major industrial centers with access to low cost electricity and source of emissions. From what we know now, three stand out, uh, Collie, uh, in WA, East Gippsland and Bass Strait adjacent to the Latrobe Valley and the Yopway Basin adjacent to Portland. And when this is combined with uh, uh, use of biomass, uh, you do have the opportunity for negative emissions as well as zero emissions in the industrial process itself. Um, and zero and negative emissions are going to have to play a significant role in uh, uh, the, the future mitigation story. Well, now transport, I spent a long time on industry, so I, I have to be quick on transport, but uh, the, the, the transformation of trans, transport is electric. Uh, electrification of transport will come directly, largely through direct current systems for railways. Uh, and that will happen where you've got sufficiently intense usage of trains to justify the infrastructure or it will come indirectly uh, through storage of renewable energy and batteries, hydrogen, or in some cases where costs of battery and hydrogen storage would be excessive, ammonia, and ammonia is probably uh, going to play its main role in long distance shipping where it's ease, of, uh, ease and low cost of transport become important. Uh, batteries and hydrogen fuel cells will do battle for competitiveness across the range of passenger and freight road vehicles. Ammonia made, uh, will have that niche uh, uh, use, I think. The balance between battery and hydrogen electric, electric vehicles will be determined by relative rates of cost reduction for the engineering systems, by the rate of increase in battery energy density, and also by the rate at which costs fall for producing hydrogen through electrolysis. Forced to guess now, I would expect the battery mostly to win out in vehicles mainly for intra-city use and hydrogen mostly over long distances. Hydrogen would be expected to do better for long distance freight on road and where direct electrification is uh, uneconomic for rail as well. But we don't have to guess. Uh, this. Uh, I hope that this will be fought out in the marketplace and uh, each, each of the battery and uh, hydrogen fuel cell will, will find its economic place. Uh, the relative balance between battery and hydrogen routes to electrification will have implications for the shape of the electricity grid. Batteries will be more conducive de to decentralized generation and storage of electricity. Economies of scale in hydrolysis may drive greater centralization of energy generation and storage through hydrogen. Biofuels may be required in a few applications, and, and again, long distance civil aviation is the standout. With 100% direct and indirect electrification and current patterns of transport use, Australian electricity demand would rise by about 50 terawatt hours for passenger cars and a bit more than that again for freight and mass passenger movement. So uh, with complete electrification of transport, we, we'd see a, uh, um, an, uh, an increase by about half in the in total power demand uh, through uh, Australia's four um, integrated electricity systems. That increase would require huge increases in renewables generation, uh, but easily managed. Uh, for renewables to be supplied from low cost locations, there would need to be substantial investments in long distance high voltage transmission. Uh, and that uh, investment is going to be worthwhile because the total cost of transmission and use of a high quality resource is going to be lower than using the residual uh, uh, opportunities left in the transmission system for, for plugging in wind or solar in suboptimal locations. Um, the demands on electricity distribution systems will be immensely expensive if users of electric vehicles plugged in their vehicles without regard for the economic cost of using grid power at different times. Uh, Marcus Brazil from this university in a recent article in the conversation suggests that with a 10% uptake of electrical, electric vehicles, each family's plugging in on arrival home from work between 6 and 7 p.m. in the middle of peak hour would generate major problems
of power systems instability. Massive investment in the distribution network will be required to remedy the problem. However, with incentives for households to fill their batteries outside the couple of hours of peak demand each day, 80% uptake will be consistent with, with grid stability without new investment. And uh, we can illustrate this uh, chart from uh, two charts from uh, Marcus Brazil's paper. That's the established pattern of demand, the big evening peak, <laughs> the morning peak. Uh, uh, if you just come home, plug in the electric car, you hugely uh, increase the uh, uh, evening peak and have to put in a lot more uh, transmission and especially distribution capacity to meet that. But if you introduce incentives that make it worthwhile for uh, uh, people to not to plug in until later in the evening, you could shift that demand structure to there. And this would not require any, any uh, grid investment at all. Uh, you'd just be using excess capacity in the grid. Um, and uh, in the second case, the increased uh, intensity of off-peak grid use would reduce unit costs of the grid by over one quarter. So that's a benefit, potentially a benefit for all users of the grid. Um, uh, this could be one path to starting to reduce that horrific wasteful overinvestment in the grid, uh, of which we spoke last week. Um, as uh, I pointed out in the 2008 and 2011 reviews, Australian regulatory arrangements uniquely in the world have provided incentives for regulated transmission and distribution companies, and to a lesser extent generators, to exacerbate peak demand. The incentive for the network monopolies comes through expanded opportunities for low risk and highly profitable <coughs> investment. So uh, the network companies do very well if you can exacerbate the, the grid because they can justify uh, more investment in the grid and, and the, the regulation allows them a return on investment that exceeds the supply price of capital to them. And so their shareholders' wealth increases, the more they can exacerbate that grid. So within current uh, regulatory arrangements, we should not leave it to the network companies to introduce incentives for people to shift consumption away from the grid. Uh, time of use pricing uh, is necessary uh, if we're going to uh, uh, take advantage of the opportunity of the electric car uh, to, uh, to uh, uh, reduce the cost of the grid and of power uh, to all users of electricity for all use. Um, time of use pricing will be most effective if it had two elements, one related to times of maximum use of the grid and one related to wholesale power prices, which may be high, either because power demand is high at that time or because supply is low at a particular time, collapse of a couple of power generators on a hot day. The incentives could take the form of massive rebates for power users who are able to hold total demand below specified levels of peak time that are modified with electricity market circumstances. Uh, not all that hard to do with modern technology. You do need a smart meter. Uh, the adjustment pains, including the costs of, of time of use meters in states other than Victoria, uh, which has them already, are small alongside the gains. Uh, there are other gains, of course, from uh, uh, time of use pricing, which would uh, increase the benefits for introducing it for the electric car. Um, as battery costs fall, there'll be opportunities for integrating use of car and house batteries in ways that greatly reduce pressure on the grid at peak times. And again, the key to encouraging uptake will be uh, incentive structures built around time of, of uh, use pricing. and. Leslie Martin, uh, who introduced me at the beginning, uh, uh, has done a lot of work on how hard that is and what things work and what things don't. Uh, but there's a big payoff for getting that right. And it's much bigger in the world of the electric car than, than it was before. Uh, demand from passenger rail is inherently concentrated in massive peaks, overlapping with the edges of the solar day and it's harder to do something about that. Than, uh, uh, but again, the solution is partly um, batteries, grid scale batteries. So, uh, in the New South Wales system, which runs from 
Sydney, uh, well, north to Newcastle, south to Wollongong, it's a huge electric system. Average uh, use of power uh, right through uh, the, the, the 24 hours, about 400 meg, but uh, peak times it rises to about a gigawatt. And then you have super peaks on that. If you get a number of electric trains taking off from a station at the same time, and it's a random process, and suddenly the, the peak goes to extraordinarily high levels. Um, this is very expensive electricity to serve, and the train companies pay a high price for that. Um, the new energy technologies will allow that, uh, the costs of serving that to be reduced. The battery, the grid scale battery is perfectly um, uh, calibrated to handle that opportunities. So will far reaching electrification of transport occur in Australia and at what pace? Well, like the answer is yes, it will occur. And on pace, like Hemingway's uh, Mike's slide into bankruptcy, it will happen gradually and then suddenly. Australia is a global up battery and hydrogen electric vehicles. Last year, electric vehicles represent about 0.2% of Australian car sales. That compares with a global average of 3.8% uh, and 5.8% in China. Uh, in other countries, recognition of the external costs of, of local atmospheric pollution and its health effects, as well as of climate change, have led to incentives to accelerate uptake of electric vehicles. As with solar and wind power at an early stage of new energy development, the expansion of sales and production in response to incentives has led to reductions in costs. This is leading into a virtuous circle of uh, falling costs and rising demand and increased production and falling costs. The most effective incentives improve access to charging infrastructure through consumer, although consumer and uh, producer subsidies have been important in some countries and very important in China. The expansion of production and reduction of costs in China is going to transform the electric vehicle market as, as it did earlier for solar PV. China's 12 five year plan way back in 2012 set a target of 5 million EVs on the road by 2020. That was visionary then. This commitment was repeated in the 2016 to 20 plan. China will reach this target with much to spare. Total EV sales in China exceeded 1 million last year and are estimated to reach 1.6 million this year. Costs come down rapidly at this scale of production. China will lead the world in production of a cheap, popular car for mass use, unless my uh, colleague uh, Sanjeev Gupta finds a way of beating them. Uh, the US, Germany, Japan, Korea, and other early leaders of the electric vehicle have concentrated at higher price points. Meanwhile, global sales and production of cars with internal combustion engines reached a peak in 2017 and has since receded. Leading car makers are concentrating research, development and commercialization on the electric car. The electric car still has higher purchase costs from the internal combustion engine, ask our Prime Minister. Uh, Bloomberg New Energy Finance has brought forward its estimate of the year of capital cost parity between the EV and cars. Um, and cars with internal combustion several times. And its latest estimate is that that capital cost parity will come in 2022. The EV has several advantages for the private user. Use energy more efficiently, two thirds to three fifths, fifths less energy for the same distance in a car of similar carrying capacity. It's, electricity is much cheaper per unit of energy than, than petrol or diesel. There are far few moving parts in an electric vehicle, fewer than 80, many of them fewer than 70, compared with an internal combustion engine, about 1,000. And that has a huge difference, makes a huge difference to maintenance costs and also the longevity of the engine. Uh, standard estimates are that uh, um, uh, a, a good electric vehicle will run uh, about uh, 10 times more kilometers than a good um, internal combustion engine. The autonomous car of the future will be electric uh, and uh, we will gradually learn the many advantages of the electric car, of the autonomous car. Uh, against this, uh, the internal combustion engine at this stage has greater range and faster refueling. These differences are likely to be removed in future by several developments in battery and charging technology, use of hydrogen in situations where these differences are crucial, 
and new patterns of car ownership and use that allow switching with the purpose of use between hydrogen and battery vehicles and more intense use of the longevity advantage of the EVs. So if you don't own your own car, if, if you're relying on the autonomous vehicle, if you've got a, uh, something on, on your, an app on your iPhone that you press when you want a car and, and you're going to uh, Adelaide, you, you get a bigger car to turn up, maybe a hydrogen car uh, and a smaller one if you're just, just going uh, across the Yarra to St Kilda. Um, that will give us much more intense use of the vehicle and we'll, we'll, we'll use more effectively the longer life uh, of an electric vehicle and bring down costs a lot. Uh, there will be pressures for all levels of government to invest heavily in public provision of charging facilities. That's the big constraint everywhere. It's a bigger constraint in Australia because we've been slow to move. Um, developments in the rest of the world will drive up front costs of, of electric vehicles down and down to and then below those of internal combustion engines, Bloomberg says 2022. From that point, it will not be long before the internal combustion engines uh, do not feature much at all in new car sales. So that's the then suddenly part of the story. Uh, I've, I've, I was going to talk about fugitive emissions, but you'll have to wait uh, for, for the book on that unless you want to ask me a question about it. Uh, they're huge and growing very rapidly, and we've got to do something about it. Uh, but uh, I won't be talking about that now. So I began by saying that uh, uh, so far emissions in industry, transport and fugitives are a big failure. Uh, as we realise the many advantages of playing a full part in the global transition to zero emissions, Pressures for policies that allow the realization of economic as well as environmental value are likely to secure policy reform. For industry and transport, the, tra the, the shift to uh, zero emissions is going to happen gradually and then suddenly it will happen in industry as well. We will be the richer for it as well as healthier and more confident of the ethics of our response to climate change. Fugitive emissions present a problem, the resolution of which requires someone to pay. Sound policy will ensure that it is not the ordinary Australian citizen. Paying by purchasing domestic offsets could be important to sustainable transformation of land use. And I'll come back to that in lecture five. Thank you. So I would like to thank Professor Garneau for sharing with us this inspiring and very detailed vision of a not so distant future where our industrial processes, the most carbon emission, carbon intensive and most industrial processes can be replaced in a way to make them carbon neutral and at the same time have growth in our, in our uh, manufacturing and export. So very interesting. We are running a little bit late on time. Um, so I think we could take maybe three or four questions. Does that sound... Uh, so about right? It's fine by me here, but others can go if they want to go. Okay, um, perfect. So, right here, please. Yeah, uh, one of the things you just very briefly touched on, uh, Ross. Please was, take uh, a mic. Uh, Wait for the mic for the online. Yes. Yeah, you briefly touched on aviation. And according to some sources, airplane flights are perhaps the single fastest growing source of greenhouse gas emissions, probably altogether five to six percent. And the number of flights annually is growing at about five to six percent. Uh, and while airplanes have become more energy efficient, fuel efficient, it's offset by, by the growing number of flights. And in Australia, uh, people think nothing of going to Europe for two or three weeks or going halfway around the world for a holiday. Universities are very much embedded in the whole pattern of flights. Uh, so there's a lot of talk about sustainability, but the elephant in the room, or one of the elephants in the room, are airplane flights. You want to care uh, to talk about that a little bit? Well, I know that the German Australian College, uh, where we're based now, does most of its international conferences uh, by televideo. And me being very old fashioned with tech, I, I sometimes get mixed up with that, but uh, it's 
it's very good for emissions. But on the general story, yeah, that's a big issue. Um, and uh, uh, civil aviation, well, the avia international civil aviation industry is actually doing something about it, uh, with controls on emissions and buying uh, buying offsets. But I think that well, uh, the technology points us to a to, to an economic pattern of a solution. Um, uh, Intracontinental travel c can be shifted to the road node, and in my view, uh, we've made a made a mistake in being laggards on use of uh, the fast rail. Um, Sydney Melbourne is one of the most intense uh, air routes in the world, and uh, we'd get a big shift uh, onto an electric fast train um, uh, if it existed. Quite a lot of research going on uh, that's. Introduce, that's uh, pointing to zero emissions uh, paths to short and medium distance, five, six, seven, eight hundred kilometers with changes in design and then getting the total use of fuel down enough to be able to use batteries or, or, or fuel cells. But we don't, but there's no uh, solution yet for the very long distance one. And, and that, uh, that does seem to be a premium use of uh, uh, of biofuel for the long term. Now that may turn out to be more expensive, which may have some effect on uh, the, how easily people fly off to Europe for three weeks. Um, we have right here in the light green shirt. Sorry, you. Uh, thank you, Professor. Um, I'm dying to say the, the question on fugitive emissions. I'm hoping someone else will ask that one. Um, but early on, you mentioned about uh, carbon sequestration and, and capture. I, apart from um, bio sequestration, I had the impression that that was the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow that was never there, that, that all the efforts to do that were failures or used too much energy. And you said Australia was ideally positioned. Could you fill in some of those possibilities? Yeah, uh, um, uh, a, a lot of the first class work has been done at the Cooperative Research Centre based at University of Melbourne. Uh, it's terrific work. Uh, and you do have the pilot plant down at uh, the Otways, uh, and uh, that, that's proven the uh, technological uh, um, suitability of, of that structure. Uh, you do have to know the structures very well, uh, reliably and safely to use it, and that's why the best locations are going to be where we know the geology in infinite detail, which is usually, and it's very expensive to drill holes and find that out. You can't do it all from remote sensing. And so it's going to be depleted oil and gas fields that are the main candidates. Some of those will be suitable for, they've held gas or oil for a long time. Some will be suitable for holding uh, uh, carbon dioxide, some won't. Uh, and uh, we, we, we've got some down near the Latrobe Valley. We've got some in Southwest Victoria. I mentioned another one uh, in the Collie region, uh, Southwest of West Australia. Uh, where you've got a, a very good site uh, and it's um, not too far from the source of emissions, then costs are not necessarily prohibitive. Now costs vary a lot depending on a number of things. One is the cost of energy. Now if you've got low cost renewable energy driving the sequestration process, then uh, not only do you not use electricity for that part of it, not use emissions intensive electricity for that part of it, but you know, reduce the cost. Um, uh, so it depends a lot on the cost of energy, uh, and uh, but it's never going to be uh, uh, very cheap. It's, it, it will get much cheaper as we do more of it. Uh, and there'll be very few, I, I doubt that it will have a role in thermal, in um, in fossil fuel based generation of electricity. I think its role is going to be uh, in capturing emissions and uh, 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 sequestering them from those uh, fossil fuel based activities that, that remain after we've done everything else. And there's some things that are very hard to get rid of and still very valuable to us. Uh, I think most of that can, will actually be done by biomass, uh, but uh, uh, but there may be some. Uh, and uh, the, the other big use is going to be bioenergy, <coughs> carbon capture and storage. But the, the technology does work. Uh, there's, there's a commercial scale plant operating commercially, uh, uh, motivated by the increased gas recovery you get from pushing down heavy 
uh, carbon dioxide into a field which pushes up methane. Uh, in Saskatchewan, the Saskatchewan Public Utilities got that. So, so there's a place for it. Uh, the special place will be in capturing emissions from zero emissions industrial processes and turning them into negative emissions. So we have a question from one of the online participants. Is that right? Yes, we try again. Key Sharp, can you ask your question now? Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you, Ross, for a very interesting uh, discussion. What I'd like to clarify is the role of biofuels with conventional transport. In the, in the current scenario, zero emission um, hydrogen electric is the panacea, but there's virtually no in hydrogen infrastructure at the moment. And the Australian Electric Vehicle Market Study, which was just done about eight, uh, 12 months ago, estimates that without government incentives to promote electric vehicles and the like, it's still going to be 25 years before even 50% of the Australian fleet is converted to electric. So in the, in the essence of even potentially in a time frame of 15 to 25 years to even get half the fleet converted to electric, and that's the conventional car fleet, I would guess it would take longer for long distance transport, does biofuels, particularly drop-in biofuels from waste and biomass, have a role to play uh, in the next 10 to 20 years in an immediate sense? Well, two parts to the question, the role of biofuels and then the, uh, tr then the time at which the sudden increase in electric vehicles comes upon us. Uh, I think that I don't believe for a moment those sorts of time frames that have come out in that and other uh, reports in recent times. Uh, Australia is not going to be comfortable. Australia is not going to be comfortable living in a, a, in a Jurassic Park of uh, internal combustion engines when the rest of the world's gone electric. Uh, we'll be driven by the rest of the world, and it's moving very. It's going to move very fast. And uh, other countries, China at at the front, but some states in the United States, California. Uh, are putting in the infrastructure that will lead to rapid take-up. Uh, it's not going to be very long before the only internal combustion cars you're going to buy are those that were, were models designed 20 years ago because no one is putting the research and development and design into a new internal combustion engine. All the exciting things will be uh, the electric and fuel cell cars. Uh, we, we are very backward, 0.2% of new sales compared with 3.8 in the world and 5.8 in China. Uh, but, uh, and we're, we're a comfortable society and a conservative one, and there's lots of good things about that. Uh, but we don't actually like staying in a Jurassic Park and uh, uh, pressure on governments. Uh, either governments will, will move anyway, as uh, the Labour opposition has said that it will, uh, or other governments will... Uh, uh, will we, we'll, we'll move uh, in response to uh, community pressure. So, oh, and biomass, sorry. Uh, I th biomass is going to be so important for specialised chemical uses as, as an alternative for gas and coal and oil uh, as a base for industrial activity that I think it's going to be priced out of, uh, of the market for uh, ordinary transport. It's just in specialized uses like the like the plane uh, over very long distances where uh, it will be uh, where the use will be valuable enough to waste a, a very scarce and valuable resource so uh, I, I think it's much more likely we'll have faster uh, electrification either the hydrogen route or batteries or both uh, then uh, then we'll start getting very large scale use of biofuels in cars so we are unfortunately way over time. Um, I would like to thank our hosts, the faculty. Well, first, I'd like to thank Professor Garneau, the Faculty of Business and Economics, the Melbourne Energy Institute, the Energy Transition Hub, and the Melbourne Sustainable Society Institute. This lectures, as with the others in the lecture series, will be available on our co-host websites in, in the coming days. Um, and finally, um, Ross is going to be publishing these lectures as a, as, as a book titled Superpower Australia's Low Carbon Opportunity. Um, if you're interested, you can pre-order with a discount. There's some cards that, that are right here up at the front. Thank you very much for coming, and thank you, Professor Garneau, for your lecture today. Yeah. Yeah. Uh,
I'm a student from Germany. Yeah. And uh, you talked a bit student about... Student here? Uh, no, in Germany. Right. In Frankfurt. Yeah. And uh, you talked a bit about uh, electricity storage and usage. Yeah. And um, I would like to know which, is, which types of battery storage are there, which is the best or the most efficient one? 